Hello everyone and welcome to Wide Sources webinar. My name is Victoria Oikinen and I'll be moderating today's session. Here with us is Sharon Shalin, Product Marketing Manager at WhiteSource, who will be presenting to you the top five things you need to know about open source security. For those of you who have not joined us in our previous webinars, I'd just like to shortly go over a few housekeeping items so you'll know how to participate in today's session. During Sharon's presentation, you'll be able to submit questions through the webinar platform. These will then be addressed at the end of the webinar during our dedicated Q&A session. In addition, please note we are recording the webinar, which we will be sending out to all attendees and registrants at the end of the session. That's it for me for now, Sean. I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Charlene. I'm Product Marketing Manager in WhiteSource, and I'm very happy to be here today. Um, even happier uh, because we're using a webinar as a platform and we're not uh, doing a physical uh, seminar, a face-to-face -face, like a current seminar, because then we'll probably have to cancel, right? <laughs> crazy, crazy corona days. Um, so I offer you a break today from the coronavirus discussion. Um, let's have a ride and talk the open source uh, security risks. Five things you need to know. Um, we'll talk about the fact that open source risk is rising and we see how we probably need to better change our mindset. Uh, we'll see some uh, graph trends, statistics. Uh, we'll talk about uh, prioritization of uh, security vulnerabilities. Um, there is there really no uh, right or wrong answer about how to do it. It's just a matter of uh, what is your business is all about and what your product is related to. Uh, so we will cover a few prioritization options. We see how we can uh, delegate uh, security responsibilities. Uh, so no more one person or group carry the burden of uh, uh, security, we delegate responsibility and we give the right tools and training in order to do it. And we see how we're shifting left security um, and all um, the values that are coming uh, together with it. Um, so without uh, further ado, let's start with a quick overview of the security market. We see in the diagram the different pillars of risk versus investment, uh, while the endpoints, data, and server pillars are roughly aligned. Uh, we see that the application and the network pillars are posing a nominal. Um, let's start with the uh, application. AppSec is becoming more challenging and complex as release frequency continue to rise and the requirements for data security are getting more strict. Uh, thanks to new DevOps practice and tools, uh, the development cycles are getting shorter, <clears throat> allowing organization to meet the market demands and to deliver better customer experience. Now, application security has gone through a transition recently uh, when information uh, security teams that used to test products before uh, release, before production, became less relevant. Uh, today, developers start um, taking part as leading role in the day-to-day -day or commercial responsibility. They are the one making the first few steps um, assessing security. Um, the AppSec risk column is very high. It's getting bigger because nowadays every organization that wants to move to the cloud needs to write its application from scratch or at least several components or at least amend it to, to move to the cloud. Um, so in a scenario that the application is moving to the cloud, we face unproportional um, security growth because uh, we're not using the same infrastructure anymore, we're not using the same protocols anymore, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
Now let's look at the network column. Um, the investment column in the network pillar is very high. And this is because I think historical reasons, the hardware manufacturer were the one uh, producing um, the network product. And network security was always fixed tightly to it as it was very obvious to everyone that whoever penetrates the network get it all. Um, in addition to that, a uh, big part of um, network is also moving to the cloud. And in the cloud, there are ample of security investment helping application to move to the cloud. So the network investment grows again, as Callum doubles. Um, so with all those forces and changes um, in the world, uh, let's see how do we run application today. In the past, it used to be all about uh, proprietary code. Nowadays, it's all about open source. Open source components um, are account for 60 to 80 percent in, in average. Um, I think that we are all aware of, of the trend of the growth. Uh, but looking at the actual numbers, uh, in two decades, we got ramped up from 10% to 80%. And it really strengths the, the trend. It explains how obvious um, it is. So WideSource conducted a survey among 700 developers from the US, from Europe, and we asked them, um, what are the challenges and practice that you face um, with open source usage? And we got amazing uh, results. 97% of the answers that we got say that they are using open source one way or another, like all the time, very often, uh, sometimes, and only a minor, minor percent of developers, like 3.2%, don't use open source component at all. And if I had to guess, I would say that it is because of company policies and nothing else. Um, in addition to this uh, very interesting and um, unequivocal survey result, we see all the big forces, all the big companies uh, in the market shift investing, um, acquiring, making sure they have all the right uh, growth engines, Microsoft, but GitHub, um, IBM, but Red Hat, uh, Google holds huge open source projects like uh, Kubernetes, like TensorFlow. Um, and in fact, open source is so successful and acknowledged uh, that it started to influence the way proprietary code is being written and shared. Um, so the name is Inner Source, and it's a new way of sharing code from within the organization. Big companies look at the value they get from open source and enforce the open source methodologies into their organization. I love it. I, love, I like this phenomenon. Seeing that open source is influencing back on the way proprietary code is is being written and shared is, is great. So we discussed uh, the growth of uh, open source and uh, the big amount of open source out of the general code. And here we see that the number of reported vulnerability is rising. <clears throat> so the number of, of reported vulnerability are indeed rising, uh, but it doesn't necessarily imply that open source components are getting less secure or trustworthy. On the contrary, I think the greater focus there is on open source and greater usage of open source components and more eyeballs are on the code looking for vulnerabilities and looking for ways to, to address and remediate them. So this trend indeed suggests that open source vulnerability is rising, but also suggests that constant usage and trust 
a community has in open source is also rising. Um, now I want to be a bit uh, cynical and say that because we are all looking for ways to be efficient and to save time and we simply dislike inventing the wheel over and over again, we will continue and embrace open source in spite of the vulnerability um, it brings. Um, because it also brings the remediation. This is a nice thing about open source. You, you get um, alerts about vulnerabilities, but you also get the fix. Like the community alerts and provide also the fixes. And this is great. Um, now, um, I want to discuss the difference between open source uh, vulnerabilities and between proprietary vulnerabilities. Because um, there are differences that require uh, different attention. Uh, when we look in, at proprietary code vulnerability in compared to open source vulnerability, uh, we see different detection uh, methods. Uh, for proprietary code, we detect for potential vulnerability and we use tools like uh, SAST, static application security testing, uh, that are also considered as white box testing, considered to be very comprehensive, uh, but also bring high volume of false positives. And another tool is DAST, stands for dynamic application uh, security testing, aka black box testing, and it detects runtime vulnerabilities, which is less comprehensive. And those two SAS and DAST are really going together. Um, with open source scanning, um, the vulnerabilities are known and open to the public. Uh, and this is, by the way, what makes them very dangerous as developers. Um, community doesn't contain only white hats like angel. Um, the information is also open to the bad guys out there and we need to bear it uh, in mind. And lastly, um, scanning phase. Um, open source vulnerability can be discovered even years after a component uh, has been released to the market. Uh, therefore, we need to continue and monitor. We can't afford just to have the scanning um, one time or one period. Like uh, an example, hard bit vulnerability was found years after the float of NSSL was released. Um, the good news about uh, open source vulnerabilities is that 90% of them have fixes. So again, the community alerts, fix, and release updates. So you need to stay alert and hear the news. Um, in the same research among those 700 developers, we also ask, how do you handle security issues? And the answer was first to detect, um, the actual vulnerability later uh, we prioritize and finally we remediate. Currently, developers spend 15 hours per month per developer on security vulnerabilities, including prioritization, including approval, back and forth emails, and only four hours on the actual remediation. So let's see how how do we prioritize? Because there are many different ways to do it. So first way to prioritize can be based on the severity of the vulnerability. High, medium, low, and it resembles the risk for the core of, of the application, the, the potential damage. A second way to prioritize can be uh, how easy or difficult it is to fix it. Um, like if we want to shrink down uh, the vulnerability list, we need to focus on the ones that are easy to fix. 
not very uh, uh, politically correct. I don't know any company that um, uh, informal allowed uh, the work to do it, but it resembles a lot. And another way to prioritize can be according to the date when it was first disclosed. The older it is, the more chances are that it will be exploited, more dangerous. Um, another way to prioritize is according to the impact of the business, the impact um, uh, to the environment, like if it involves customer data, if it involves intellectual property, if it involves specific uh, personnel. Um, and last but not least, uh, there is a way to prioritize according to uh, effective or non-effective vulnerability. And this will lead me to the next slide where I'm going to explain how we define um, effective vulnerability. Uh, so when we're writing code, the proprietary code can call different libraries and those libraries may or may not contain vulnerabilities. When our proprietary code is making call to a vulnerable function inside a library, then we treat it as effective vulnerability. When the proprietary code is not making a call to the vulnerable component inside the library, then it's a non-effective vulnerability. And since there are many components uh, in a library, we should only look for a specific vulnerable method inside uh, that our code is calling to. So after testing 2,000 Java applications, White Source found that 85% of all detected vulnerabilities were actually non-effective. A huge amount of time that we can save by approaching all the effective vulnerabilities and freer time to daily projects. If we remember two slides back, we, we saw that um, on average developers spend around 15 hours uh, per developer per month, then we can actually bring back 12 hours to a daily project, and that's a lot. Also, by assessing the effective vulnerability, we dramatically reduce risk. As not, as not always we get to solve all vulnerabilities, or at least not solve them on time, uh, <laughs> politically correct things. Um, and may I remind that open source vulnerabilities are out in the open, then every minute that we spend or not sorting the effective vulnerability, you're actually posing a risk. Even if we chose uh, a different method of prioritization that accidentally left the effective vulnerability to the end, then we probably chose a very risk way to do prioritization. Because um, the entire time that we were dealing in other things, the actual danger vulnerabilities were still um, were still there. Um, so bridging the gap is a must. Yes, it's a must, and let's see how we can do it with uh, security DevOps and developers, three groups. Uh, that are coming from three different disciplines. Uh, developer and operations are closer one to another. They are getting measured by uh, similar parameters like time sprints, product release, while security is getting measured by a complete different set of parameters, security related parameters. Hence, they tend to push and pull to different directions, and this phenomenon is making a lot of sense. Lately, we see that those disciplines, the gaps between them, narrow them in baby steps. Uh, security is being spread slowly into the regular routine of the developers. In addition, developers are being empowered, possessing more knowledge, training, and tools in order to actually amend security vulnerabilities. Embedding security into developers and DevOps is what we call DevSecOps. 
and fundamentally relate to three things. First one is the integration of security aspects and, and practices into DevOps. Second, Agile. Use Agile methodologies and deliver small pieces of code in frequent release. And last, automation. Automate whenever possible. We don't want to send people to do machine capable job. Um, after realizing that security must become part of the development life cycle, it's important now to determine what will be the best stage to integrate. So instead of waiting for the security checks to the end of the SDLC and suffer from com complexity, inefficiency, bottlenecks, we push automation, awareness, and responsibility into the first few stages of the development. By doing so, we're providing developers with faster and automatic way to remediate those uh, security vulnerabilities. Now, developers with the right tools, with the right training, with the right knowledge, will actually turn uh, to be security advocates and gatekeepers to security in a positive way. Um, the slide here is actually showing what's going on in reality. If in the previous slide I was talking about uh, shifting left, it was more of shifting left in a PowerPoint diagram, and it's easy, right? But this slide showing reality is showing the adoption of security shift left model. Um, so in the past, responsibility for security um, of the, the application was traditionally in hands of company security professionals. Developers used to design, build a product, and then security experts uh, would perform their tests, their reviews, and flag for uh, issues that requires remediation. So everyone pretty much knew what the role was all about and contained. <clears throat> However, these days those lines are not clear anymore. The boundaries are, are getting shifts and those lines are now blurred. Um, what we see is clear movement of ownership. Around 70% of the respondent stated that ownership lies in the software development side. And it doesn't matter if it's DevOps, developers, team leaders on software development teams, but still development side. While only around 30%, what we see 25, 30, 31% uh, think that the security is still in the hands of security team. And if I may say that those numbers are also a bit misleading, I think, because when you ask someone who's in charge of security and one of the answers is security team, then this is the natural um, ad hoc reply. But if you ask someone uh, who's in charge of uh, remediating vulnerabilities, then maybe the answers were even higher in favor of developers. I don't know, it's just a guess. Um, we can also see that the smaller organization is, uh, the shift left phenomenon is adapted uh, faster and more developers are doing security type of work and this explains um, the little gap between the 31% to the 25% when the organization is uh, smaller. The impact of developers taking over security is integrating security tool earlier in the SDLC. So in contrast of the waterfall methodology that we used in the past, security was only reviewed before the release and sent back, security issues for a developer to investigate. Today, modern DevOps relies on testing for vulnerabilities early and often. 
trying to avoid the, the time wasting um, bottlenecks before uh, release. So we see that 66% of developers are taking action toward application testing on build stage or before. And I look at the 36% of organizations that are trying to integrate security testing tools at earlier points in the SDLC, like the IDE, repositories. This is even emphasized that phenomena stronger. Um, no real difference was found between SMB, SME, and enterprise. We did find a strong correlation between companies where developers rely heavily on open source components and companies that test their application uh, before the bit. And it's not much of a surprise as both are uh, characteristic of uh, mature DevOps organizations. So we talked about efficiency, we talked about developers' empowerment, we talked about avoiding bottlenecks. And if you need extra motivation for embracing security as early as possible, now it's my time. Just look at those numbers, they talk for themselves. Um, the difference between $80 vulnerability fixed cost in coding stage blows up to $7,600 in production, stage, in production stage, sorry. The gap is huge. It's nearly 100 times higher. So we shift left uh, and start tackling security issue from coding and building rather than assessing security in production or right before that. And shifting left is also shifting the mindset and by providing developers more tools, more training, more knowledge, we can resolve problems when they face them as, as early as browsing for code. Yes, tools like that exist in the market. You can find vulnerabilities starting from browsing for code. Um, today, there are plugins, integration that allows developers to get information of open source components and risk issues inside the IDE. So really no effort. The, everything is in your regular environment. And the motivation is huge. We see three top values of adopting uh, shift left. First is time, time saving. With the move to DevSecOps and having security part of the development cycle, vulnerabilities are detected and remediated much faster. Second is cost, cost reduction. We saw in the previous slide that nearly 100 times different was before tackling vulnerability in coding stage or tackling vulnerability in production, production stage. And last is quality, um, secure by design. When security is becoming an integral part of the development, together with the introduction of automation and tools, quality is much better. So, uh, to summarize, the way to develop code is changing. And open source is everywhere. With open source come the open source vulnerabilities that are rising and requires different methods and tools to tackle them. And those tools and methods necessary uh, different from the proprietary code uh, methods and tools as we saw. Um, DevOps and security are becoming one Streamlined DevSecOps actually allows the security shift left method. And the potential of introducing the shift left method brings better quality, cost saving, and time saving. All those goodies. And with this, I'll thank you very much for your time and open the floor to questions. It's Q&A time. Yes, indeed. Thanks uh, for the presentation, Shalon. So, as you said, we've reached the Q&A session. 
And I'm happy to see we have quite a few questions from the audience, so let's get right to it. Sharon, first question. How can I improve my vulnerability prioritization? All right. Um, then, as we saw, uh, there are different ways to prioritize vulnerabilities. And there is no right or wrong how to prioritize and how to tackle vulnerabilities. It's mainly according to, to your audience, uh, the way you're building your code and your products. And you need to think uh, whether your application is touching customer data, uh, whether you have intellectual property. Those kind of things can um, uh, give you an idea about what to solve first. Uh, another way to prioritize uh, is according to the vulnerable, um, effective or non-effective method. We touched it just a little bit, uh, but I want to emphasize how um, big the value of uh, prioritizing according to that. Um, assuming that we have um, high severity vulnerability, then if we would prioritize according to severity, we would probably tackle this uh, vulnerability first. But, if we have a way to prioritize according to effective or non-effective uh, vulnerability, then we would have known that there is no actual route between our proprietary code and this vulnerable method. So in spite of the fact that I have a vulnerability in high severity in the library, I'm not touching it. I'm not calling this method. And I'm actually not in danger. Because in runtime, we're not going to call it and it won't pose any danger to the application. So while I'm trying to remediate this high severity vulnerability, I'm kind of losing time to tackle other vulnerabilities that are effective to my application, that my proprietary code are calling to. Um, so yeah, it kind of gives few ideas about how to prioritize. We also covered uh, other ways during the presentation. I hope it um, answered the question. Okay, next question. What's the best way to remediate vulnerabilities? Are there any specific tools for that that you recommend? Um, yes, indeed. Um, developers, um, are, it's, it's not a matter of um, uh, being uh, lazy, it's a matter of being uh, productive. We don't want to do a uh, manual type of work with uh, updating or upgrading things that we can get automatically, right? So already today, there are several tools out there in the market that can automatically suggest a pull request that the only thing you need to do is to accept the changes and you can be sure that you're not breaking the code. Um, so I'm always in favor of um, automation. Automatic tools are great and they're really um, ease our day. So this is my uh, 20 steps about that. Okay, last question. What tools are available to train developers to incorporate security into the development process? Um, yeah, um, it's already happening. Like we're already giving developers the uh, responsibility of remediation, uh, remediating vulnerabilities. Um, but in addition to, to the responsibility, we need to make sure that our bring um, developers team with the right training and knowledge to do that um, and the right tools. Um, having the responsibility as a, as a standalone will not, uh, will not help. Um, so if we are aware of this phenomena and what's happening with the uh, DevSec, Ops, then we need to make sure that the developers are trained and have the right knowledge and also the right tools in place. The moment they, that's, they will start doing that, 
um, uh, they will also be um, happy and proud with the results and they will acknowledge the success. Perfect. And that is basically a wrap up of today's session. Sean, thank you so much for today's presentation. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who has attended today's session and watched our webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the White Source team. Um, and with that, I'll say goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.